nice, sis. Mommy. What's different about her? The boobs. She had a little touch-up. Your father had one final request, and we are going to honor it. He just wanted his kids under one roof. So for the next seven days, you are all grounded. Hey. What? Oh, no, 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 we're just sitting in an awkward silence. So I have another advanced screening to talk about, and this time the movie in question is This Is Where I Leave You, a comedy drama based on the novel of the same name, which, shock of all shocks, I haven't read. What else would you expect? And what is kind of shocking is the movie was actually written by the same guy who wrote the novel, which is something you don't see very often, and it was directed by Sean Levy. And the story behind this one is it, it focuses on four siblings. There's Judd, played by Jason Bateman, who is the, uh, the middle brother of the family and is currently going through a bit of a rough spot in his life as he lost his marriage and his job in one fell swoop when he caught his boss, Pork, and his wife. Obviously not a happy day for him. And then there's uh, Corey Stoll, who plays Paul, the older and more responsible brother, or at least he tries to be. And then there's Adam Driver, who plays Philip, the younger brother and the perpetual fuck-up of the family. And Wendy, their sister, played by Tina Fey, who is the bossy sister that you find in pretty much every family. And then there's their mother, played by Jane Fonda. And they've all come together recently because their father has tragically passed away. And... Apparently, his dying wish was that they participate in a, some sort of Jewish tradition, which is called sitting Shiva, because their father was atheist Jewish, as the movie describes him. Uh, and, and basically, sitting Shiva means for a period of seven days, Shiva is literally the Hebrew word for seven, uh, the family gathers together in the home of the deceased and basically mourns the loss together for one week and uh, sits at the home and receives guests and whatnot. And of course, this family is dysfunctional as all hell. They put the fun in dysfunctional, definitely. And when you have all these people coming together for a period of seven days who have so many problems in their personal lives and also to some extent with each other, oh, the shit hits the fan so fast. And that's where we get uh, many comedic and dramatic moments in this movie. And, you know, this sounds like a recipe for a decent comedy, if nothing else. And for the most part, it is. In fact, most of the comedic moments in this movie do hit far more often than they miss. Um, I, in fact, I can't really think offhand of any jokes that absolutely fail in this. The comedy is actually very well written. Um, for the most part, the acting is fairly solid. Um... Really, the weak link in the movie in terms of acting is Jason Bateman, which is a bit unfortunate because the movie focuses on his character far more than any of the others, and if you're going to be the focus of the movie, it really sucks if you're the weak link acting-wise. Not that his performance is particularly bad or anything, it's just that next to everyone else, when he's in there with, you know, Jane Fonda and Adam Driver, and especially with Tina Fey, who completely steals this movie because of course she does, then, you know, his mediocrity just becomes that much more obvious, uh, which is really a shame. It's not a bad performance by any means, just relatively bad compared to everyone else. Um, but yeah, mo most of the jokes are very solid. Uh, most of the dramatic moments are okay as well, but that aspect of the movie is much more hit and miss. Um, this movie does have a lot of issues when it comes to the dramatic side, and also in terms of the plot. In fact, really, there is no plot. I mean, there's, you know, there, there's a story of the father dying and them all gathering together for Shiva, but that's not really a plot. That's just the reason for getting all these characters in one place. Really, the movie is just a series of subplots. And these subplots all focus on the four individual siblings. Uh, for Judd, I mentioned, you know, he's going through a divorce and finds himself unemployed and recently lost his father. And also, now that he's spending some more time in his hometown where he grew up, he is also 
kind of rekindling an old romance with some uh, girl he used to know in high school. And that's basically his story. And uh, Tina Fey's character, her subplot... See, she has some of the strongest comedic moments in the movie, but in terms of the drama, it's really doesn't go much of anywhere. Because there's, uh, there's this uh, guy she used to know back when she was in school who is uh, actually living across the street from her mother's house. He still lives with his mother because at some point, way back when, he suffered a brain injury and really isn't capable of living on his own. And... Uh, Wendy and he were dating at the time, and after the brain injury, they split up, and she feels a bit guilty about that. And on top of that, she's also having some issues in her own marriage, which kind of comes out of nowhere, because it's never really brought up until, like, the last third of the movie, really. It's like the fifth day of the Shiva is when this finally is brought up. And just comes out of nowhere and is never really resolved. N none of her subplot is actually resolved. It's, it just kind of is left hanging at the end of the movie. Uh, the older brother, uh, Paul, um, his character, he and his wife are trying to have a child, and so far it has been an exercise in futility, and they're wondering if they might have some sort of a fertility problem somewhere between them. His wife is all in a panic because she's taking all these fertility drugs and desperately trying to get herself knocked up, and it's not working, and she's wondering if her husband is maybe the cause of all this and not her, but he doesn't want to get a sperm tested and all this and all that, and it goes nowhere. There's no resolution to any of this. It just it, it goes absolutely nowhere. And the other part of Paul's subplot is he is apparently the majority owner of the family business. Which, come to think of it, they never actually mention what that family business is. Just realize that they, they, it's a store of some sort, but that's all we know. That's all they ever mention. It's just a store. And they're arguing over this store because I guess he, he owns most of it and the other three siblings own a smaller part of it. He wants to run the store his way and wants to just buy everyone else out just so he can have complete ownership of it and do his own thing. The rest of them aren't cool with that. And we have no idea what the hell this business is. What, what does this store sell? What goods and services do they offer? Is it organic groceries? Sporting goods? Sex toys? I don't know. Um, actually... <laughs> You know, given the dysfunctional nature of this family, I would not put it past him if that was actually the case. That, that, that would almost fit. Um, but yeah, we don't know. And this is brought up, I think, on the second day of the Shiva, and then never mentioned again until the very end. It's, to the movie's credit, at least this subplot is resolved. It, if you can even call it a subplot, it's more of just a moment in the story, but that they do at least resolve it, but just at the very end, completely out of nowhere, just basically Judd walks up to Paul and says, hey, with the store, how about we do this? Paul says, yeah, okay, done. Okay, way to put some thought into that. And then there's Philip, who is the, the younger brother and the perpetual fuck-up, as I said. His subplot, basically, he is... Uh, currently in therapy and dating his therapist. Certainly no conflict of interest there. Oh, his therapist is also about 15 years his senior. And he's basically just using her as a sugar mama and has a rather nice car to show for it. So, good for him, I guess. And that subplot at least does get resolved in the end, but it's very predictable. Of course their relationship is not going to last, and no, that's not a spoiler, because you know as soon as these characters are introduced that that's how it's going to end. There's no other way it can end. And then there's the mom who doesn't really have uh, much of a story to speak of. She's basically just there to, you know, make a few humorous comments here and there, uh, most of which involve her breast implants. Because, of course. <laughs> yeah, dysfunctional family. And... Yeah, she really doesn't have much to do apart from the occasional uh, funny line here and there until the very end of the movie when 
I won't give away what happens. I will simply just say it comes right the hell out of nowhere in a good way. <laughs> it was genuinely surprising. I did not see it coming and it was kind of funny as well. And it's really too bad. Jane Fonda seems a bit underused in this movie, honestly. I wish she had been given a little bit more to do. Uh, be because when she's on camera, she's she does very well in this film. Another issue I had with this movie was the pacing. Um, for about the first half, it flows pretty well. There's a pretty good balance of comedy and drama. The, uh, the dysfunctional nature of the family really shines through in a very entertaining way. But somewhere around the halfway point, it turns into a never-ending string of the last few minutes of a TGIF sitcom. Seriously, that, that's pretty much what it does, complete with the I've learned something today music. All, all of a sudden you have, there's like three of these scenes in a row where there's just two of the siblings talking to each other and you know talking about their various issues, not, not in an overly comedic way, much more dramatic in nature, and you have that same goddamn music playing in the background every single time. It's the end of a fucking episode of Full House. And it does that over and over and over again. And I'm thinking, is this going to be the entire rest of the movie? But, and then they show oh, in one purely comedic scene. And then there's another goddamn TGIF sitcom ending. It's just, what the hell? Like, okay, we get it. It was weirdest fucking thing ever. And one more issue I had, which isn't necessarily with the movie, but more with the trailers that I saw. Um, the trailers make no mention of Shiva at all. In fact, if you watch the trailer, it gives you the impression that their father's dying wish was for them to all be grounded for a week. That's, that's actually what they say. And yes, that line is in the movie. You know, there is a point where Jane Fonda says, well, this was your father's wish. This is what he wanted. So for the next seven days, you're grounded. But it's meant to be a joke. It's not that the father actually wanted them grounded as if they were still children. That was not the point. And the movie kind of kissed, the trailer rather, really gave me the impression otherwise. Um, I guess I kind of understand why they didn't actually mention the word Shiva because most people probably don't know what that is unless you happen to be Jewish. Um, I had never heard the term before myself, but... Still, that is misleading as all hell, and if you couldn't come up with a way to describe that without it being misleading... No, of course you could. Of course you could. Just say, father's died, all the family is together for the funeral. Leave it at that. Like, re really, this is not that difficult. So as far as a recommendation, I would say... It's probably not worth seeing in theaters. Save your money there, but... Um, I would say it's worth a rental. Because even though it does have a lot of issues, there are some funny moments in here that do make the movie worth seeing. Some very good performances as well, uh, particularly from Tina Fey and Adam Driver and Jane Fonda. So it's worth seeing, just not worth seeing for a lot of money. So when it hits Redbox or Netflix or whatever, give it a rental. And that's about all I have to say about This Is Where I Leave You. So until next time, this is where I leave you. <laughs> Take care. I left the baby monitor on upstairs. Oh, there we go. There. Turn it off. Turn it up. Oh, Turn it up. Stick a baby in there, Paul. Shove a baby up there. It's a circle of life, everybody. Let's go, Altmans. I'm just trying to get home.